Innovation happens at breakneck speed in digital health. In fact, things change so fast it can be tough to stay in the know. I looked and looked for a podcast that was dedicated to showcasing the hottest products, companies, and trends, and it didn't exist. So I created it. This is the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health, and I'm your host, Mike Moore. Welcome to another episode of the Bleeding Edge of Digital Health. We're going to be um, doing a few things differently here today, which I'm really excited about. One of the changes is we're going to do an audio-only podcast with Dr. Bertolon Mesco. For those of you that don't know him, which I'm guessing there's very few, he is the medical futurist. He is a voice of the industry. He is on the cutting edge of all things digital health and could not be more excited about having him on, on the show to hear today. Dr. Mesco, how are you doing? Thank you, Michael, for the invitation. I'm doing very fine. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. As I shared with you, Dr. Mesco, you know, previously the show, you know, typically we spotlight, you know, either companies that have technologies that are, you know, creating a radical new category in digital health or transforming an existing one. But in the ethos of this show, one of the things I wanted to do is make sure I didn't just feature products. I want to feature trends and things that are really impacting our industry outside of just the the construct of technology so or or products I should say and as a result of that we're doing kind of a capsule collection of of interviewing a, a couple of individuals who I believe to be the you know kind of the people out there that are really forging the future of digital health and certainly you fall into that category so I was really excited to have you come on the show one of the things I think I kind of like to start at a macro level I'd like to start at a macro level with here is just to get your you know your impression of what you know and and you have a unique perspective because obviously you've got a huge international presence you're not just focused in any one country Globally, what do you think the number one pressing issue that needs to be addressed in digital health is right now? Well, quite a hard question to start with. <laughs> I think the number one, the biggest challenge now is to help everyone involved in healthcare to acknowledge the importance of patient empowerment. Mm -hmm. Normally, people would expect me to come up with certain technologies to focus on, or these are the ones that will change the world. There are some technologies with that that kind of impact or potential impact, but I think the paradigm shift that we have been living through, which is called digital health, and it's about the idea that for the first time in the history of medicine, now patients can sit at the same table where only their physicians have been sitting at since, two, since the dawn of modern medicine. Mm -hmm. I think that simply is the biggest milestone in the history. And, and that's, the, that's the challenge we should all focus on to acknowledge the importance of patient empowerment because everything, every technological trend, every major change in how we deliver healthcare, how we practice medicine would come after that. Because this is the change that initiated this whole transformation that again, we call digital health. And we have many more challenges to worry about from the lack of regulations or regulating artificial intelligence in healthcare, helping the healthcare workforce to, to acquire new skills, find technological trends that improve the doctor-patient relationship. And I can go on forever, mm -hmm. but if I have to pinpoint one, then that would be acknowledging the importance of patient empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too, because you mentioned that they're, the, the patients are at the same table as the physician now. And interestingly enough, oftentimes that table is in their living room. You know, there, there's a huge shift in care from the acute care setting, the hospital to, you know, so many of these technologies are driving the care into the, into the patient's home. And so it's, you know, that, that sometimes that, that table isn't necessarily at the hospital anymore. It's uh, not just um, the patients feeling empowered, but the location in which the care is taking place is also drastically being impacted. Exactly. That's the end story of the digital health paradigm shift that patients will become the point of care. Of course, there will be interventional procedures even 20 years from now, and, and we will have big radiology machines. So the, the physical location that we call hospitals or practices today will have an important place to play or have an important place in healthcare in the future, but patients will become the point of cares. Wherever they are, they should be able to receive diagnosis, monitoring, even treatment because of the access to new technologies to data, to information, interfaces, second opinion, peer support, so many things that used to only be able in the ivory tower of medicine. Right. Even as a medical student back then, that's what they tried to teach me, that I should know the answer to everything and I can access all the things as a physician and I let patients come into my ivory tower and I tell them what to do 
and then they should just leave the tower and go home and comply with the treatment right. I prescribe for them. But th this model is simply outdated. Yeah, and I think a lot of it too is, you know, because of health inequities and things like that, it's not always just the fact that the patient doesn't want to comply. There's often things that they can't, that cause them to not be able to comply. You know, you could, if you had a, a patient with a structural abnormality, whether it's a, a tendon issue or a broken bone or whatnot, and you prescribe physical therapy and they can't, they don't have anybody to take them back and forth to physical therapy, that that's not a choice, you know, that's just a fact of circumstance. And interestingly enough, with all of these, you know, AI platforms, physical therapy platforms that are being, you know, bringing this, you know, onto the tablet or bringing it into a, a smartphone in the, in the patient's living room. It really is, it's giving the patient a choice now. And I think that's a, that's a big distinction. That's a huge point you're making here, because this is what has changed because of the pandemic. Right. That millions of patients realize that they, have, they actually have a choice. They have a choice of going to a laboratory to have their blood test taken and wait in line with other sick people or there are at-home lab tests, like how the tens of millions of us have been doing COVID antigen tests, and I think we have become quite good at doing that. <laughs> right. So they, they realize they have a choice. They, they won't want to come back to the old way of doing things. And this is just about at-home lab tests. Yep. When you realize that you can obtain data about your health or disease management that you can use to make better decisions, of course you want to keep on using them. And even if you have a great medical professional and you see you receive perfect medical care, your treatment decision is just like one point of decision in your healthcare journey. Anyone who had a major disease or a family member who had a major disease must know that a monitoring, a treatment process comes with hundreds of such decision points. Even if many of those are minor ones about lifestyle choices, but those are very important to the person, the, the patient that we are talking about. And, and I understand that why many patients feel left behind because they were told what to do, they go home, but they have a hundred more questions to ask and they have no chance to access healthcare again with those sort of minor questions. And I think these are the gaps or, or this, this issue represents a gap and there are many gaps like that, that only the use of advanced technologies could fill in. Yep. Absolutely. No, I 100% agree. I would think we've all walked out of the physician's office and thought, man, I wish I would have asked him or her that or this or, okay, I, I go do this, but then I didn't realize that I need to also know X, Y, and Z after that. And it just, it's a little bewildering. It's frustrating. It's deflating. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really it's a big problem to fix, but we've got a lot of really smart people on the task. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see the I think things are trending in the right direction, actually. For the first time here in the U.S., my, my perspective is different than yours in that it's not an international one. But I will tell you that for the first time, I'm starting to see efficiencies in the system that are causing me to be bullish about the direction of healthcare in our country. And it's going to take power like AI and ML and deep learning to be able to compensate for the existing inefficiencies. But... I think the future is promising. So, especially, I mean, I think we are, you know, equally romantic and optimistic about the future. Mm -hmm. I always believe in people and hope that we can do things better because we can do them better today. But you, especially living in the future, should be even more optimistic than anyone else. And please, those living in the US that do not like how healthcare is being delivered there, please don't find my home address and come and punch me in the face. But I believe that the Food and Drug Administration has been the absolute the most prominent example in the world about regulating these advanced technologies. I mean, they were the first ones to have a patient advisory board for a regulatory body. Yep. They were the first ones to hold workshops for companies doing 3D printing and 3D bioprinting products. They were the first ones to approve a 3D printed medication, the first ones to approve artificial intelligence based technologies. So. If anyone should be optimistic about the future of healthcare, it should be people living in the U.S. Yeah, the FDA is they, they get a bad rap, and they don't do everything perfect, but they do. They are course, they are the course, they yeah. are the gold standard internationally for a regu the regulatory body. But if you want to switch regulatory bodies with my country anytime, just let me know, <laughs> and I I send them to you with, on one flight, and that's it. <laughs> what a, a, a one way flight, right? I want to reflect. I hear you. I hear you. No offense to them, of course. I love them, but no. Anyway. Yeah. So, hey, I got to tell you, I absolutely love your Digital Health in a Minute series. I listened to all 11 of them. And for those of you out there that haven't done that, I highly advise you going to the Medical Futurist site 
and taking a look at it. It's an incredible education in all things, not all things, but many of the top, top hot topics in digital health. And Dr. Mesco runs through that in one minute segments and they're bite size segments that are, you, you do a really good job of boiling things down to a, a very, very cogent message and being able to understand it. So kudos to you for putting that together. That that was- Thank you so much for appreciating that. Actually doing those one minute challenges, like explaining machine learning in healthcare in 60 seconds- It's not easy. Is a bit harder than it sounds, but- <laughs> But I have to mention that it's not me, but myself alone doing that. I have a very supportive, amazing team of 15 people behind the Medical Futurist and, and I'm very happy and, and lucky to have them. And that's how we can produce you know, that much content over a range of uh, social media channels. Yeah, no, it, it's an incredible series. I took one thing above all out of that and I wanted to just kind of get your thoughts on, you mentioned in the future, telemedicine will, be, will just become medicine. And I thought that was such an interesting paradigm shift. When do you think that will happen? <laughs> yeah, that's the question every futurist wants to avoid at all costs. <laughs> so I'm glad I the asked. Reason why is that, and the reason why is that because I live like that already. I, I mean, at, at least the part, the equal level partnership I personally have as a patient with my primary care professional, and the way we use telemedicine for me is just medicine because she keeps on helping me in any communication channels. And the reason why I said that that telemedicine would be just a new norm. Well, there are many reasons for that. First of all, 5 million healthcare workers are missing according to the WHO. So simply, we will never train as many physicians as we need ever. I mean, I could be more optimistic about that, but even using AI while teaching medical students, I just don't see the structural change in medical education that would lead to training millions of physicians right away. It's just not the case. Yeah. Why the number of patients requiring medical help has been uh, not skyrocketing, but has been increasing rapidly, not because patients get you know sicker, but because we can diagnose more patients and see like more than 1 billion patients haven't even accessed any kind of healthcare in some underdeveloped regions in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason. The second reason is that we never say, I mean, at least I don't say that I sit in my car and I use GPS to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I don't say that I digitally navigate to some place. I just go there. Right. Because using GPS has become such a commonplace. I see telemedicine, the digital ways of communication, the same way. We will not just practice medicine digitally or remotely. We will just practice medicine and deliver healthcare. And of course, we use remote care platforms, digital channels. In by, by doing that, because it is, I think, I'm thinking about like life five, ten years from now, it will be a luxury to be able to meet a healthcare professional with any kind of health issues. It has been a luxury already, but we haven't had a chance to realize it mm -hmm. or acknowledge it. And we just think that that's the norm, but that's simply unsustainable. Plus, let's be honest, even from a medical point of view, we don't have to see a physician in person for any kind of health issue, especially when we have a well-formed, established relationship with them. Can you elaborate on one key point of that? You said it, five years from now, it will be it will be a luxury. It's a luxury now, but we don't realize it. What's going to change in five years from now that causes you to believe, and, and I believe, that it will become less available? First of all, the, the gap, the mathematical gap yep. between the number of physicians we have who work and the number of patients requiring medical help will keep on increasing. Yep. This is just basic mathematics based on the trends today. The second reason is that the amount of data I will be able to access about myself, my health and disease management will be impossible to analyze again by myself. I will need some sort of external help. And if it's not artificial narrow intelligence uh, rushing to my help, then I will need my physician to help me analyze the data. Right. And it means these two things means that the number of decision points and or the number of discussions or meetings I would need with my medical professional will keep on increasing. And physically, it's unsustainable. So at some point, we have to come to the conclusion that if we keep on allowing people who have access to healthcare to be able to meet a physician with even a, a minor cold or a flu, without any major clinical consequences, and take away the chance from others with more important, more major conditions to deal with to access the same in-person care, then that, that's not going to be fair. And mm -hmm. I think we'll have to, now we have to make populations get accustomed to the idea that it's not normal, that you can just 
start coughing in the morning and you can meet uh, your primary care professional that day. It's just not normal. It, it used to be normal back in the old days, but it's not anymore because then we cannot treat, we cannot care for those that truly require medical expertise and, and supervision right now. And we have to sensitize patients for that idea. I know it. So the reason why I'm, I've been saying this out loud so many times that telemedicine will be the new norm is not because I believe that with technologies we can provide better care. I think it's much better if I can meet a physician in a few minutes and he, she can see me and we can come to a conclusion. It's much better, but it's simply physically unsustainable. It's a scale issue. It's a scale issue. And it. I think it's already a scale issue, but we live, you and I live in parts of the world where it's still doable in a logistical way. But in for billions of patients, it's just, it's a luxury already. So we have to get a bit more sensitive about this. We have to accept that it's not normal to meet one. And that's why I think the primary, the initial line of primary care will consist of the access to certain technologies. I'm talking about chatbot, artificial intelligence-based chatbot services, conversational AI, some technologies that can do an initial assessment about our health. And if it's needed, then of course, we would be redirected to a, to meeting, to being able to meet a professional in person but not in the initial line. And I know it doesn't sound great. It, it's not something we want to see in the future, but then let's train like 15 million physicians in five years and we can change that. But of course it's impossible. Let's have fewer patients, like half a billion fewer patients. That's not going to be the case, no matter how healthy we start living all of us. So that's something that's, I think, inevitable in the near future. And it makes sense to me as a futurist to start making people think about these changes now when they have a bit few more years to live in the same way they used to live. Because by the time this new world arrives, this new norm becomes commonplace, we should get ready. We should be able to acknowledge these changes. Yeah. You know, two things come to mind. One is, I think what you're leading to is that it's going to become very similar to when you call your credit card company and they say, you know, what are you here for basically? And, you, and they say, are you trying to make a payment? And you say, yes. And then they go, okay, what's your credit card number? You put that in. What's your security code? What's your expiration date? Okay. Yeah. Here, we can automatically pay your, your credit card. You know, we can, you know, type in your bank account number, type in your routing number, type in the amount that you want to pay, make a payment for. And all of that gets done without talking to anybody live. Those are the rudimentary things that we call our credit card company for. And those are the things that, that I, I, I think what you're alluding to is those are the, the rudimentary things that are done in healthcare are going to be done by automation, whether it's via telephone or AI or chatbots or whatever. The other thing that, I, that comes to mind is we're already seeing this here in the United States. I was a member of Kaiser Healthcare several years ago, five years ago, maybe. Great care, by the way. Kaiser, when I was a kid, it was called Killer Kaiser, right? I mean, it was like the, it was, it was just, Kaiser was a little bit before its time, unfortunately for them, and they got a bad rap. But now Kaiser delivers amazing care. But what was interesting is when I was, when I would have a cold or a flu and I'd go to the doctor or I'd go to the clinic, I should say, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't see a doctor. I would see an NP, I would see a PA for the rudimentary things. And then, you know, you would see the physician for your annual physical. And then if you were really sick, then you would see the, the physician. And so I think we're starting to see that shift in some of the progressive organizations here in the US, such as Kaiser already. I can't speak again to internationally, but everything that we're seeing here speaks exactly to what you're saying. And I think, you know, technology will just be the next level to that. So I appreciate your thought. And if you don't mind me just reflecting on your two points. First, the first point, I think these things are very similar in concept. But in practice, unfortunately not. And that's why I've been advocating for the need of including medical futurism or medical futuristic studies in life sciences. I, I've been advocating for employing futurists, professional futurists, not people who call themselves futurists on LinkedIn, but professional futurists with a research background in um, regulatory bodies, in healthcare governments, in major healthcare organizations, in medical associations. Because thinking about the near future in medicine and healthcare is so much different from any other industry because of its unique characteristics that it makes sense to prepare for that in a different way. Yeah, the stakes are higher. The stakes are high, exactly, because if you make a mistake as a, a digital banking solution, then maybe your client loses money. But if I make one, then the patient might die. And I'm, you know, I know it doesn't happen every time, but that's the stake that we are talking about 
in healthcare. The, the regulations are worse, far worse than any other industry. If you come up with the world's most exciting state-of-the-art technological innovation today in energy, I think from tomorrow, you will be the hero and companies and governments would start using it right away. In healthcare, if you do the same, it will take years because of evidence-based medicine until the time that you can start implementing those in practice for a reason, that we have to make sure that only tested, safe products reach people and get into the lives of patients. So then we can keep them healthy and safe for as long as possible. That's why health yep. is so unique and that's why it's so important to, to employ futuristic studies into the mindset of those people that make decisions about the near future of healthcare. And along those lines, I saw yet was it yesterday on on LinkedIn. Do you want to talk a little bit about the you recently got a it sounded like you took a, a big step in terms of getting a medical futurist program set up over in your country. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Of course I would love to. That's the biggest thing that has happened in my life for many years. And I cannot tell you how happy I am that that when I did very briefly, my childhood dream was to become a, a physician doing research in genetics. At the age of six, I knew I would dedicate my life to it. And, and when I graduated from medical school, I was in the PhD program already. I finished my PhD and I became a medical geneticist. I thought that that's the, that's the top of my word. Right. But my love for, my passion for technologies was missing from that. So I, I decided to switch to futuristic studies, which was very exciting for me. And since then, I've been trying to establish this new field of science or a new branch of science called medical futuristic studies. And to be able to say that now I will be a PhD supervisor and I will have PhD students who would love to do a doctoral program in medical futuristic studies. So they would become, you know, better futurists than I am focusing on medicine and healthcare. I cannot tell you how happy I am. And you can see me now, now how I'm smiling, but it's just simply incredible. It's a big challenge. I faced the challenge already trying to make the Senate of the professors at my alma mater, my university where I graduated, to accept this program as a branch that no university or medical school has ever accepted around the world. So that, that's a big challenge already. But now to, to bring PhD students through this program and try to transmit to them what I learned from my PhD supervisor, it, it simply feels amazing. So this is the first program worldwide. I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah, there are programs, of course, about digital health, about artificial intelligence and sure, healthcare. Sure. But this one is about the futuristic, the futuristic studies components of thinking about advanced technologies. It's about using foresight techniques, forecasting, horizon scanning, trend spotting, specifically for technological and cultural trends about the near future of medicine and healthcare. I have never seen even something close to that as a part of a doctoral program in any medical school in the world. Wow. Congratulations. A thank you so much. Congratulations. That is a huge feather in your cap. I just told my wife, I cannot wait to interview future students. And uh, I've been joking about the questions I would ask them, whether what kind of hobbies they have, because they won't have any in the next four years. So <laughs> let's have as much fun as you can right now before starting the program. No, I'm just joking around, of course, but I cannot wait to start working with them because we are producing so many papers and studies at the Medical Futurist Institute that now it's it's a resource problem. So we need students, PhD students to to dedicate their lives to that and, and we can be even more productive than before. Yeah, yeah. One of the big mottos or thought processes at my alma mater, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is a, a heavy engineering school, is see one, do one, teach one. And you know, and and to be able for you now to be able to I don't know that you necessarily saw one because you've you've been pretty much on the front edge of all this, but to be able to, you know, kind of build a thought leadership around this and now to be able to release that at, at scale through others is, has got to be hugely rewarding. So sincere congrats to you and we'll be excited to, to watch the, the many students come out of that program. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for that. Yeah. So as I told you, um, you know, many of the people, you know, I run an executive search firm. Many of the people that listen to this show, listen to it from the perspective of what companies are going to be hot coming out, what technologies are going to be hot coming out. What, or, You know, can you t speak to maybe just, you know, one or two things that you kind of look for when you're assessing a technology, not from so much a clinical perspective, because as we know, things can be great clinically, but they, you know, if the dollars don't make sense, then it tends to not, it tends to not work in the market. 
So when you're looking at a digital health company, is there a couple things that you look at when you're trying to assess, is this really going to fly? And then maybe conversely, are there one or two yellow or red flags where you see something with a technology or a market, a, a, a uniqueness in that market where you say, these are things that I look for as, you know, that might be a stinker. I'd love to get your perspective on that. Absolutely. I would love to give you that because I, we just published like two days ago, the, the global digital health 100, the, the top 100 digital health companies list on the medical futures.com. I do that every year. So I, I checked about 300 companies in the last few weeks and I've been quite into that. But basically I look for things anyone would look for in the first place, in the first step as maybe a viable business model, whether the technology that the company is focusing on would find its place in the hype cycle of 50 emerging digital health trends I published last year. I will look at how transparent their communication is on their website through social media, whether they have published any studies, but I published um, a so-called digital health bingo. I know it's a weird title, but I wanted to grab, grab people's attention about it, which would be like six points that I always look for when I try to assess the quality of digital health company, maybe a press release, a tech announcement. And one thing is whether the, what the company is working on meets a real life patient or clinical need, mm -hmm. because even if you think you have come up with something exciting technologically, but it doesn't improve anything for patients and physicians, then what's the point of having that in medicine or, or healthcare? Mm -hmm. The second is maybe the most important for me as a researcher is that the technology has to be scientifically backed. If they come up with something exciting, but they cannot put enough evidence behind it, Physically, no physician will be able to use their technology, even if it's, it could save lives of millions of patients. So we need peer reviewed studies. We need clinical trials. And I have some good examples about that. I'm happy to share if that's something that you're interested in, but being scientifically backed is crucial in this industry. The third is maybe the, the basic concept of digital health as a definition when we published it in 2018 is that the def technology should share data not just with medical professionals, but also with patients. Because there are many great medical technologies out there that physicians can use in a hospital, but digital health technologies are different. They also share data with patients. And this way, these technologies can, can get patients even more engaged in their disease and health management. The fourth is like a guiding light in my mind for companies is that it should improve the doctor-patient relationship. So when I think about electronic medical records, I'm not sure if any EMR platform has ever improved any kind of doctor-patient relationship. But when I look at voice-to-text applications that use AI and that would allow physicians to have a real-life conversation with patients while keeping the eye contact, and the app could write down everything in a medical record format that the physician has to check at the end of the, the in-person meeting, for me, that would definitely improve the doctor-patient sure. relationship as a technological trend. The fifth is that it has to use a technology users already own, because if you want me to buy, and I have plenty, I have purchased plenty <laughs> of data. I'm looking on my, at my right, I have four, four shelves full of about 150 digital health gadgets I have tested in my life. I don't want to buy one more. Right. So if I have something already, like my smartphone, and you would like to, like to use that for a medical healthcare purpose, with your technology, count me in. Skin checking apps is an example that comes to mind that uses this sure. technology people already own. And the sixth is that it should help make healthcare globalized because that's the end story of the digital health paradigm shift. And we are living, we have been living through this paradigm shift already. And while I think it will get done in about 10 years or so, it would make sense to prepare for the next paradigm shift, which will come after that. We have tackled this one, and this is going to be when patients are members of their own medical team already, then we will have automation becoming the newest member. And now physicians try to find out, you know, how to behave with a new member patients sitting at the same table. But imagine how these two stakeholders will, will feel and how they will behave when automation will want to sit at that table. So these are the six points I, I like to go through when I try to assess the, the quality of a new technological announcement or a new company. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. I'll make sure to have the uh, my editing team get those in the show notes because I know that those are going to be wildly popular with the audience. Everybody's going to everybody's trying to figure out how do you assess these companies, and there's no perfect Rubik's 
cube to solve there. It's um, everybody's got a different framework, but I like the way that you you succinctly organized that. We've seen here in the United States, and I guess you could say it globally because these are international companies, these are multinational companies, but we've seen companies like Google, Amazon, Apple, you know, one step forward, two steps back. They get into healthcare, they back, they take a step back. What do you make of the challenge that they're facing? I have my own opinions, but what you know, why do you think that th- these companies they innovate at will, they they dominate at will, they disrupt at will, and then they step into healthcare and it's a big, you know, kind of a, the air goes out of the room. What do you make of that? I don't think it's a challenge the technology giants are facing because it's not like we people working in, working for healthcare, want them to dive into the healthcare business. I think it's an, it's a clear incentive that they are seeing that, mm-hmm. and they thought they would know how to do it but it's healthcare, so they don't. And I think they have been trying to do their best, but they have been most of, I think, failing most of the times. But let's have no doubts that tech giants will play a role in delivering healthcare. The reason why is simply because and that, that's the incentive I think they, they have been seeing. There's too much money in it, not to. I think that's the, that's the incentive, of course, but the maybe the, the door they saw first was that healthcare started becoming more dependent on technologies. And they are good at developing technologies people want to use. Tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people want to use. They know they are good at that. And they thought that as digital health and all these trends make healthcare more technology-based, that's our our cue to start diving into that. And of course, there is a huge amount of money that we could get like a piece of the pie, the healthcare business pie. And they tried and they failed because it's a a different animal. (laughs) What's the one thing you think keeps that's caused those companies to fail. I'll tell you, uh, for for me, the challenge is when technology and healthcare merge, there's people that understand the technology, but they don't necessarily understand the delivery networks. And then you have people that understand the delivery networks, but they don't understand the technology and how those are typically, you know, launched at scale. And so finding talent out there that really understands both sides of the table is really difficult. And, and there's a power struggle between those two, I believe. But I would love to get your perspective on like, if you could pinpoint one thing that's kept those companies from being successful in that space thus far, which we all agree that they, they will make a huge impact. But thus far, what do you think has been their biggest challenge? I think it's going to sound weird, but I think if I have to pinpoint one thing, that's the lack of humility in yeah. trying to dive into healthcare, simply because we know that they are the best at making those technologies that we will need in delivering healthcare and practicing medicine. And they can do that. But without enough amount of humility diving into this business by thinking that they simply know better because they can do technologies, that's not going to work. And they will keep on failing because of the evidence-based background of medicine, because of, because of the stakes that we have here in medicine and healthcare because of the the cultural transformation that's going on now. And plus, on the top of that, now tech giants, you know, want to deliver healthcare. It's mind blowing. So if someone is not excited about the idea that companies like Amazon or Walmart want to provide primary care, it's like, what if BMW wanted to persuade you that for the next car upgrade, you could get a remote care consultation while being in your car? You would ask, what? What? Yeah, that's what's going on. But with tech giants, I think because of the lack of humility they have been showing in this space, they will keep on failing. But if they understand that they have a huge value to bring to the table, but there are parts of the healthcare business they will they will not understand in the next decade or so, which is about regulation, which is about understand acknowledging the stake that we have here, which is about acknowledging the culture of information. Without those patients, yeah, they won't be able to dive into that. But if they understand these then I think we will have quite fruitful collaborations between tech giants and healthcare institutions. And this is what we published as an open access database a few weeks ago, the first database of all the collaborations between tech giants and healthcare institutions. We found about 34 of these collaborations, which is all all of them about huge amount of data, sharing medical data, medical records with those companies. So in exchange, the healthcare institutions, the hospitals, either get to use the product for free or they get some money, financial benefits from sharing, you know, after sharing the data. So it's, it's exciting and we will need them because healthcare companies, pharma, biotech companies, let's be honest, are not so good 
and I try to find the, the kindest form of saying this <laughs> at developing technologies that people want to use. They are really awful at doing that, let's be honest. Yep. But with the help of technology giants, we patients, I think, should look at these future collaborations like something really exciting that will make healthcare simply better. Yeah. I want to be sensitive to time here. So I want to ask you one more question. And this is a question that's, I believe, many US, or I should say many digital health companies are facing specifically in the US. And again, I always preface this by saying you have an international perspective. I have a more of a US perspective. But one of the challenges I see with a lot of our digital health clients is the question or the the challenge of data ownership and you know the battle between you know let's say there's an AI company that is going to you know be able to overlay on a traditional scan whether it's a CT MRI whatever and be able to on an ongoing basis monitor their existing patient database but also retroactively go back and say hey you missed these patients that are maybe are are good candidates for XYZ procedure or whatnot. And what we're hearing from a lot of our clients is that when they go to these institutions and the contract, everybody says, yeah, this is great. The contracts will be written and the hospital will say, hey, this is our data. You can use this data while we're in contract with you. But the second we're not in contract with you, you have to wipe this data from your system. And these companies are being built on their data companies, right? The AI platform is just an opportunity or a means of aggregating more data, which is where the real value in these companies is. How do you see that playing out? How do you think this ultimately will get resolved? This is quite the, the sensitive topic for me because the futurist, I think I should be very objective here and advocate for the need for even better regulations to protect patients' privacy. But <laughs> instead of doing that, I for years I've been saying that we have to stop being naive. And at this point, being naive means that thinking that without losing some of our privacy, we can still have this amazing digital health and AI revolution. That's physically impossible. As you mentioned, without our data, there is no revolution. The AI algorithms are only as good as the data we feed it with. So what I've been trying to do at The Medical Futurist is to make people more sensitive about the fact that they will have to give up some of their privacy if they want to have a chance to live a long and healthy life. So the question that the question I keep getting is whether it's possible to keep our privacy intact during this digital health revolution. Of course not. The right question we have to, we have, we have to ask ourselves is how much of my privacy I am willing to give up in exchange for a chance for a long and healthy life. And if that decision depends on my, if, if I'm the one making that decision alone, not my government, not my pharma company or health insurance company, ethically, I think... Of course, ethically, I should be fine, but we will lose some of our privacy. Of course, then synthetic data comes into the picture. I think yesterday I reviewed like the 10th paper in the last two, three months in a scientific journal about creating synthetic medical records mm -hmm. and how using AI, we can create more synthetic data. That The data that we could use with other AI-based algorithms to to make better decisions on the go. And it sounds like one potential solution, but in the meantime, it's not just AI. When I had my genome sequenced and I clicked on do not share my data with third parties, I'm pretty sure that those companies, I had like six genomic tests, I'm sure that those companies shared my data, my anonymized data, which is not really possible in, in genetic data right. sets. But I think they, they sold my data to third parties, to pharma companies. But in the meantime, what I benefited from this process, the, from this product, is that I know what kind of medications I would have serious side effects for. I know what kind of risks I have for certain major diseases. So we designed a preventive plan with my primary care professional to try to avoid those taking place in my life. So I'm the one deciding how much of my privacy I gave up in exchange for clinically important information that we can use in my care. As I was the one deciding that, ethically, I feel fine for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think rather than what we're seeing here where the hospitals and the digital health companies are bickering back and forth about who owns the data, I think the easy solution is, is let the patient decide who gets to keep it. But they don't. <laughs> but in practice, they don't. I know. I know. And I think that would be the easiest way to do it. Let the, let the patient say, hey, 
we're going to run this scan on you. The hospital would like to have a copy of your data. And so would this company. Are you okay with A? And are you okay with B acquiring it? And if they say yes, then let the patient decide rather than letting the attorneys decide. I think that'd be the quickest way to, from point A to point B to get, to really get actionable insights, which is what everybody wants over here. Or three, we can put your data through an NFT and then you would benefit from it financially on the long term. I think no company would buy it later, but at least that would be the case. Like when DeepMind started a relationship with the Moorfields Hospital in the NHS in the United Kingdom, and they got access to a huge amount of retina scans to train their algorithms on, on those data sets, there was no consent from patients individually. But, you know... If I'm right now as as Petal or Meshko, the medical futurist, I ha- I had a chance to talk to the individual patient. I would tell them that, well, your retina scan got shared with a third party company. They cannot. I don't think they can identify you based on your retina scan. And what right. we get as a society as a benefit from it, there will be an algorithm that can look at your retina scan in a second and describe your chance for I don't know heart disease. Wouldn't it Parkinson, be very whatever. useful, you know, in in your care? And what you lost along the way is that someone, like an algorithm, not even a person, saw your retina scan. I don't want to, you know, diminish the problem here. It's a very huge privacy issue and patients' consents will be very much important and needed. But we have to say out loud that if this is what I get as a benefit from this deal, it's a deal actually, and I'm the one making the decision, again, I should be fine ethically. 100%. Hundred percent. Yeah, the NFT is obviously the long-term solution where the patient can monetize that or protect that, securitize that, and be able to to dole it out as they see fit in deals, which is exactly your, to use that term. Your term, yes, that is a deal. Then, yeah, that's. I, I think that's the long-term answer. The short-term answer would be at least to tear down the wall between the digital health companies and the providers such that we can just start moving this stuff forward. And I think if, if we put that in the hands of the patient, that would be the short term, that would be a short term solution. But I agree with you. Dr. Mesco, I'm going to let you go here because I know you've got a busy schedule to keep. I want to give you a sincere thank, thank you for joining the show today. I know the audience is going to really enjoy this conversation. And I say this in all seriousness, I'm a true fan. I love everything that you put out. I follow you closely. And there's not too many people out there that, um, you know, that I really, when, when they say something, I pay attention, but, but you are one of them. So to have you on the show was a true honor. And again, thank you for making the time and wishing you huge success with your new program, the doctorate program we spoke about. And hopefully we get you back on the show at some point in the future uh, to do another recap. I really appreciate it. That would be really great. And, and thank you so much for having me. And the pleasure was, was really mine. It was amazing. And, and thank you for what you do with this podcast. It's really important to, to get the word out about all these detailed things and insights about digital health. So, so people like you and I, who are very optimistic about the future, maybe our number will keep on growing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's it, folks. This is another episode of The Bleeding Edge of Digital Health with Dr. Bertolon Mesco, the medical futurist. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time. Hey, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Listen, if you enjoyed the show, please hit that subscribe button and leave us a review and rating. That'll let others know the show is definitely worth checking out. Also, if there's a product, company, or trend you'd like to see featured on the show, just shoot me an email. My address will be in the show notes. Take care, and I'll catch you next time.